Hey, good morning everyone, thanks for coming. Um, what we're going to talk today is talk about today is about mental energy. Um, so what we're going to cover is what mental energy is, um, how it works, why it's important, um, what happens if you run out of mental energy, and how you can use use this and the knowledge of this uh, to be more productive and more creative as a software developer or as a manager or as whatever kind of job you do. The first bit about me, my name is Andrew Hall, I work at Compare the Market in the UK, which is a price comparison website. Uh, you go on there and buy your life insurance or whatever. Um, I realised I looked quite young, about 12, um, but <laughs> I've actually got uh, 15 years of working in IT, uh, working across different job roles, so started off in custom support, we did uh, doing some testing and QA stuff, and then was training manager for a while, and then I've been doing development full time for a long time. I started coding when I was five, and then uh, I've recently moved down to the dark side, so I've just, just changed this week to become a project manager. So uh, we've got a bit of a range of all different jobs there. Okay, so let's get into it. So, what is mental energy? That's all that's what you're all here to find out. So. What we need to do is, first of all, we need to talk about when we're building a web application, or when we're building a, any application for developers, what are we building it from? So often it seems that, that we start with nothing, and then some magic happens in the middle, and then we've got the end product at the end. It's easy to work out what the resource would be if you were a painter, you'd use paint in a canvas. If you were a bricklayer, you'd use bricks to build your thing. But as a developer, what is our resource? Our resource is actually mental energy. So we use that mental energy to create things and make things for other people. So the more of that we have, the more um, mental energy we have, the more creative and more productive we can be. Okay. So what I want to uh, take, uh, start off with is that there's no separation between your work life and your home life when it comes to mental energy. So when you go home tired at the end of the day, you'll be sitting at a desk typing away and doing some programming. You're not physically tired, you're not tired because you've been carrying things and moving around, you're mentally tired. And when you go home, you're still going to be mentally tired, you're not magically going to be awake again. Um, so, the way this actually works, and the way this actually makes you feel tired, is because your mental energy is used up. And that gets used up by making decisions. So, every time you're making a decision, now that might be reading an email, what do I have to do with it? Do I have to reply to it? Do I have to forward it? Do I have to do something? It might be actually writing some code, what should I write, which function should I use, it might be debugging a code, why does this do this, why does this do this, but every time we're making a decision and thinking about something, we're actually using that mental energy. So if you're starting a new project, you might you might think, uh, which language should I write this in, uh, which framework should I use, should I use callbacks, promises, what, what should I use? And this um, process is called decision fatigue, so as you run out of this mental energy, you become mentally fatigued and it's called decision fatigue. So how does it actually work? Um, we all know how physical energy works. You wake up in the morning, and you feel most of the time ready to go for the day, full of energy. And then as you go through your day, maybe you have to walk to the train station, uh, maybe you go to the gym at lunch, or after work, or whatever, and tell you throughout the day, you feel more and more physically tired because you're actually even doing things with your body. And that's exactly the same way as mental energy works, but just using your mind. So every time you're doing something, every time you're doing some work, it takes away some of your mental energy. So, if we, we can think of this like a health bar in a video game. So when you start the game, you've got a full health bar, maybe you get hit by an enemy, so maybe that might be, oh, I've got to debug this code, I don't know how it works. <laughs> or, or whatever it could be, so you get hit by an enemy and you lose some of that, that energy that you've got, you started off with, when your health bar is depleted. And that's exactly how mental energy works. You start with a full bar of mental energy, and as you do more and more things, that depletes, 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 until it's empty. Now there's various ways you can temporarily increase that. Um, what I'll talk about later is how you can make the most of your mental energy. Um, but what we talk about now is how you can uh, temporarily increase that. So one way is through eating. And we'll see some examples of why this is relevant later on. But mental energy is related to actually to blood sugar. 70% of the body's, glu uh, body's glucose is used by the brain. So we need to um, make sure that you know, we eat and we, we use that because that's actually a resource that feeds our mental energy. Um, the other one is sleeping, that resets it, the same as physical energy, resets. Another one that people have suggested to me was actually physical exercise. So we're talking about using the mental resource here and what happens when that gets depleted, and what happens when we've used all that up. So if we switch to um, doing physical exercise and we're actually using a different resource, 
and it gives our mental energy a chance to, to regenerate. So, in order to understand how these decisions take a toll on us and how, they, how different uh, each decision costs, we need to first of all talk about ways of thinking. So don't worry, it's not rocket science, it's just neuroscience, so that's fine. Uh, when people think about things, they don't think about all things in the same way. Things aren't equal. You do know this from programming, some things are really easy to do, it's a really easy solution, and some things take a lot of effort to do. The same as if you're a manager, some things are easy to deal with, and other things take a lot more effort. And depending on which one of these two systems that I'm going to talk about in a second we use, depends on how much energy it takes. So, the first, the first type of um, thinking we've got is called system one thinking. Now that is fast and intuitive. And it's based on instinct and things we actually know internally. So, if you see someone's face and they're snarling at you, you know instantly they're angry. You don't have to think, what is that emotion that person is expressing? Okay, it's anger. You just know they're angry or if they're happy, it's the same thing. If I ask any of you your age, probably could just tell me your age and how to actually think about it. You don't have to think, what year was I born? Okay, what year is it now? Take that one from that one. You just know. That's the system one thing, the things that you know. So, say you're doing programming and you've got a compilation error and you think, oh, this is semicolon. Easy, right? There's things that you just know are there and you can easily do. The other way of thinking is system two thinking, and that's more deliberate and more slow. So we use system two when we want to solve problems, we want to actually focus on things. But anytime we actually actively engage our mind, we're doing system two thinking. So as I said earlier about uh, debugging, so you have to actually focus on what you're doing. To think about it, you have to step through, you have to think, why is this doing this, why is this doing this? You can't just go, this is the answer. It's conscious thought. So to give you an example of that, let's talk about some maths examples. So, can someone tell me what 2 plus 2 is? It's 4, yeah? So you just knew that. You didn't have to think, okay, I've got 1, 2, and 1, 2. And I've got 1, 2, 3, 4. You just knew the answer. That system one thing, that snap decision, that quick decision you've got there. But can someone tell me what 657 by, times by 453 is? No. You have to actively engage your system 2 thinking in order to work it out. It's a conscious effort there. So, the comparison is, system one, you know the answer. System two, you have to actively engage that to get to the answer. So, that's all well and good. Uh, but, let's talk about this example. So, how many of each animal did Moses take on the ark? Anyone shout out? Two, two people saying two? So, how, I'll ask you again. How many animals, how many of each animal did Moses take on the ark? It's wrong. <laughs> It wasn't Moses. Correct. It wasn't Moses. It was Noah. But that's your system one thinking. System one is, is arrogant and it thinks it knows the answer to everything. So your brain sees animal, ark, and you think you know the answer. But you don't. You didn't look at that. You didn't engage your mind. You did. System one said, I know the answer to this. This is the answer. And that's fine. So um, this is the same as optical illusion. So when you see an optical illusion, your system one thinks, oh, maybe that's got that line's longer than this, or this line's But if you think about it logically, or you draw the extra lines in, it's obvious to you that um, they're all the same. The system one takes control and thinks it knows the answer to every question that you ask it. The brain basically looks for an easy way to process information. So, system one thinking is not as expensive as system two thinking for your mental energy. So, your brain will always try to optimize and use system one. But, this can cause a problem as we just saw. We just saw that system one thinking told us a completely wrong answer to the question. There was a mistake in there. Effectively, there was a bug in my question. See where this is going, don't you? Yeah. Okay, so... Okay, so, yeah, the brain also may try to ask itself an easier question in order, in order for it to use the system one thinking rather than system two thinking. So, for example, if you're doing development and you think, okay, I've written some code, and you, you're probably not asking yourself, is this code the perfect code I could write? You're probably not asking, um, are there any bugs in this, have I tested it? You're just asking, will it do? Yeah. And that's system one thinking, is it okay? Yep. You're not actually thinking about it co uh, cognitively and consciously to decide whether that's actually the right thing to do. 
The same thing about uh, people going to the gym. So if you sign up for a gym, it's probably because you want to get fit or lose weight. But after a long day at the office, do you ask yourself, do I want to get fit? Or do you ask yourself, do I want to go to the gym? You ask yourself, do I want to go to the gym? So you get, nah, it's fine. But if you thought about it, the reason you signed up for the gym in the first place is to lose weight or become fitter. Or and that's the real question you should be asking. But system one takes over and says, nah, let's, let's take the easy way out. Okay, so what happens if you have no mental energy left? So if you've been sitting at your desk all day, you've done some really hard work in the day, you feel mentally tired and drained, what ha actually happens to you? So one thing is you can actually feel tired, you know, you can feel mentally tired, like you want to go to bed. We talked about earlier about how sleep can actually replenish that. But what actually happens is you make knee-jerk decisions because you switch back to that system one thinking. You've got no resource left to use that system to. You can't actively engage proper thinking. What happens instead is your brain goes, let's take the easy way out. I've got no energy left. Let's take the easy way out. So when you're writing code, maybe you're maybe you writing some SQL code or some database code, and you think, ah, that'll do. And then later on, there's an SQL injection in that. Let's go just floor in that. Because you, you've kind of just thought, ah, you'll be fine. No one will find that. It's always the taking the easy way out, the, the quick decision, because you can't process it properly. There's some examples of, uh, of this in real life, some studies, and then you can look them up in more detail if you want to look at these uh, URLs. So, in this study, this example, two groups were asked to walk down a hallway remembering numbers. One group was asked to remember a two digit number, so let's say 41. And the second group was asked to remember a seven digit number. You can make your own example for that. At the end of the hallway, they were asked, do you want to eat cake or do you want to eat fruit? And more people in the seven digit number chose to eat the cake. And we'll kind of explain some of this as we go through, but also it's because we talked about a second ago that that's taken a toll on them. That's a longer, a harder decision. They had to engage system two thinking rather than system one thinking to think 41. That's easy. But the other group had to think, okay, I've got this number, it's 1,256,852. That you can see easily that that's a lot more effort than the remembering a two digit number. So they chose that because they wanted to uh, improve, sorry, they wanted to replenish their mental energy. Well, they had use of mental energy of that, and therefore they chose the cake. Okay, so there's another example of um, parole cases in Israel. So over a study of a thousand parole cases, in the morning, if you had the first session of the day, you had a 65% chance of having a favorable hearing. So if you're a prisoner trying to get parole, you had a 65% chance of having a favourable hearing. But by the end of the day, you had almost no chance, almost 0% of chance, because basically the judge was mentally tired. He didn't, have the, he didn't have the ability, he didn't have the resource left to make a conscious decision about that. He just went, no, no, no. That was the easy way out for him, because he had no mental energy left to make a proper decision about that. But what's interesting is just after lunch, it jumped back up to 65%. So that he was able to make this conscious decision again. And what that means for us is maybe we should think about when we're doing our, our work because you can see from that that at the end of the day we don't make good decisions. So when should we do the most important thing? When should we work on the most critical part of the system? Probably when we're best able to do it. So you've heard all this and you've kind of thinking, oh yeah, I think this is something I need to look at. What can I do? How can I help this? So there's a few things you can do. So what I'm going to go and talk about now is the things that you can do easily, and then talk about what others have done, and then what I've done. So, from a really, really basic point of view, cut out the stuff that you don't need to do. Make less decisions. Now, you might say, oh, I don't, I don't, there's no way to make less decisions. I'm a programmer, I've got to do this. But what about when you're on Reddit every five minutes, or seeing on Facebook or Twitter, Every time you're processing, say, the Reddit front page, you're reading the title of the article, deciding, should I read this? Should I upvote this? Decision, 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 decision. The same even with reading email. Should I reply to this? Do I have to do something? Do I have to put this on a task list somewhere else? Do I have to process this in some other way? Every time you're doing that, it still counts as a decision. Now, they might be small decisions. Some of those things would be system one thinking, and some of them would be system two. If you get an email from your boss, you probably have to read it properly. 
and it gets some automated email alert and you just delete it. So there's some things you can do there that instead of constantly checking, you can kind of get the summary. So for example, one thing I was quite keen on doing was checking Happy News every five minutes to see what was going on. So instead of doing that, I just changed it to have, send me an email once a day with a summary of the top stories that day. So instead of processing it 10 times a day, 15, sometimes more than that a day, I just get one, one summary. And I can just process at least one of the most popular stories for that day. So I'm only process, spending my time processing that once, and I'm still not missing out on what it was I actually wanted to get from that. And also, as we saw from the, the previous example, um, making decisions earlier in the day or making them after lunch are really the, the key time that you can make proper decisions. So if you're thinking about architecturing a new piece of software, don't do it at 5 o'clock on a Friday because you're going to make a bad decision. You're going to think, that'll do, that'll work. Get it out to a customer, but then you're a career protector. Also, if you want to ask your boss for a pay rise, do it in the morning. Otherwise, we just say no, not that church. So, we're going to move on to now to talk about what other people do. So, you might know who this is, maybe. Uh, so, if you think about it, really, as developers, the jobs that we do and people like these leaders do are not actually that decision because we're not actually that different. We're all making decisions over and over again as part of our jobs. We're not doing it, as I said earlier, we're not doing a, a manual, manual labour job, we're not just going, like moving things, whatever. It's all about decisions. So, if you see Obama, you normally see him wearing one of two outfits, his business outfit or his leisure outfit. And there's a quote from him that says, you'll see I only wear blue or grey suits. I'm trying to pare down decisions I don't want to make decisions about what I eat or what I wear because I have too many other decisions to make. Now, I'm not suggesting that you all go and wear the same clothes every day. Some people do. I've given this talk before and someone came up to me at the end and said, yes, I've actually started doing that. I wear the same clothes every day. Not the same clothes, because you just think. But it's got all of the, you know, lots of different clothes the same, so he doesn't have to decide in the morning what to wear. That's one decision less for him. He just goes to his wardrobe, puts his clothes on, that's it. That's an extreme version. I'm not suggesting that. There's another quote there you can see on the, on the screen, so you can't be going through the day distracted by trivia. So all these things are distracting from his ability to be able to do his job effectively and well. Now if we talk as well about, this is apparently Steve Jobs. Um, if you think about pictures you've ever seen of Steve Jobs, he's always wearing a black turtleneck. And that's for the same reason. He always chose to wear that because um, it was another decision he didn't have to make as part of his, his day. So he'd be able to be more creative and more productive. As I said, I'm not trying to tell you to not ever go on the internet, not ever go on Facebook, not ever read Reddit, not ever read Hacker News, wear the same clothes every day, eat the same thing. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is choose what's important to you. Is it really important if you check Hacker News 25, 30, 40 times a day? Is that, is that really important? Do you need to do that? Or could you actually be spending that time and energy on something better, something more productive or something more useful? So yeah, I'm not expecting you all to come out of this and see you all tomorrow wearing the same clothes as today. That's not what I'm trying to say here. I'm just trying to say, maybe in your jobs or in your life, you're making some decisions which are unnecessary and you can get the benefit of cutting those out. So I'm going to move on to now to talk about what I did. So can everybody get their phone out, please? Can you please load either Facebook or Twitter, but don't do anything else? Have you got Facebook? Okay. okay. Can you a couple of seconds just to do that? Okay, so don't do anything yet. But what I want you to do when I say is start scrolling and raise your hand as soon as you see a stupid video, a picture of a cat, or a baby with someone you went to school with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Okay, so there's loads of people with their hands up, right? That's... Okay, that's great. So within 30 seconds, almost everybody found something that wasn't, wasn't relevant to them. So every time you're looking down your Facebook feed or your Twitter feed, and you do that, that's a decision. 
do I want to like this? Do I want to comment on this? And if I comment on this, what will my friends think of me? Maybe. Depends what you're right. Um, so what I did is I actually took a social media holiday. So I quit Facebook, I quit Twitter, and then made about five minutes went back on Twitter, but yeah. <laughs> And I'm still not on Facebook, and that was over a year ago now, probably about 18 months ago. So, because what I was doing before was the same as kind of Hacker News like I mentioned earlier, I was always on my phone checking, seeing what the latest news was, seeing what was going on. I didn't want to miss out on what was going on. But what I actually, um, you know, and then I tried to, like I said, do I like this? Should I comment on this? And I was trying to think of funny things to say. And all that things were, all those things were decisions and a toll that were taking on me. So, think about the health bar we talked about earlier. Every time I did that, a small half a heart would go, half a heart, half a heart, and then I could do something else, we'd hack a news for a long time, and then, you know, two hearts would go, things like that. So what actually happened when I did this? I saw a lot less cat pictures, a lot, like, no, I had to go and look for them in my own time. Um, but I had more free time and energy, mental energy. Actually, what happened was I was bored at first, because at that time, that time that I'd spent on Facebook before, I didn't know what to do with it, I didn't know how to redistribute that time. So what I actually did was turn that into like, creativity and productivity, and it's actually the reason that I'm standing here in front of you today, because I was able to take that time and energy that I would have been doing that, and start applying for conferences, writing slides, writing proposals. I actually did that because I stopped doing Facebook. Another thing that I do, because we know that decisions are difficult, is actually outsource a lot of the personal things. Not my main job, that there are people that have done that, but my personal side. We said earlier that you can't share your work life, or your work mental energy, and your personal mental energy. So what about if you could cut down all of the, the personal stuff, all the stuff that you don't want to do that's personal, and we're able to be more effective or do better things personal. So one of the things I do is, is outsource the jobs that I don't want to do. So if you want to, let's say, book a restaurant, if you want to book a restaurant, you need to maybe go on the internet, search for the type of food you want in the location, read 56 reviews to find the best one. Then you've got to ring the restaurant, and then they might not be open or might be busy, so you've got to ring them back later. Make a reservation, and then you've probably got to add it to your calendar so you don't forget about it. Why? One, two, three, at least four decisions. Why? Get someone else to do it for you. <laughs> So um, this is actually a service that I use, you know, or a short link to the service that I use, and I'm happy to talk about it later in a bit more detail. If you come and find me outside, I can show you my account and what it did. Um, but there's actually a team of real people that will go and do that for you. It's not expensive. You just send them an email or whatever, and they'll go and do that for you. Uh, so they're based in the US, but they'll do tasks around the world anywhere that speaks English. Um, but they also do various, various other things as well. So. Um, say, for example, you wanted to find presents for a 55-year-old woman that liked gardening. They go on Amazon, they go on maybe a gardening website, they collate a full list for you. You can just press that one list rather than having to go through Amazon and the gardening website. They will do that for you. You think of the decisions that you're saving then. My, another one of my colleagues needed to find a dentist that was taking new, uh, new applications. And in order to do that, they had to ring five or six dentists. Like, have you got any application? These are my details. What he could have done was use the service, he did use the service in the end, was he could just email these people his details, they will ring out for him, register him, all done. So within an hour it was done. Imagine how much time and effort that would have taken you to do that. Go on the internet, research the dentist, ring them, it's the same as the restaurant example really, but just think about that. But yeah, as I said, come and find me afterwards if you want to know more details. Okay. So Coming towards the end now, what I want to say here is that although you start the day with a certain amount of mental energy, I want to reiterate the point that I'm not trying to make you do none of the things that you find enjoyable. Some of those things that you do might give you inspiration, might help you. So maybe you go on, I don't know, if you're a designer, you go on Dribble and see loads of designs on there and they might give you inspiration. That's not a waste of time. I'm just saying find the things that are a waste of time for you. Find the things that you don't need to do. Find the best way to optimize your life. So you can be the best developer or best manager or best designer. Whatever, you, whatever it is you do, we all strive to be the best that we can, we can, we should do. So 
if you follow these steps or do some of these things, then that should help you be more productive and more creative. More creative. So you start the day with a certain amount of mental energy, and when you run out, you make bad decisions. You switch from that system two thinking, that conscious um, thought about what you're doing, into snap decisions. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. It's not. We know. We all know from experience that if we're in that mindset, we think. It never is. Someone always finds it in the end. Someone always finds the bug. It's always on the busiest day or on a weekend or when no one's in the office or it's a holiday. Someone will always find that problem in the end. Choose what works for you. Okay. So, just before I finish up, I've got a challenge for you. What I'd like you to do is choose one thing. One thing in your life that you don't need to do anymore find a way to optimize it. So maybe it's the Facebook example. Maybe you could spend less time on Facebook or quit Facebook if you're really strong about that. Maybe you've got a build process which you cannot, opt you cannot automate like with you know, Grunt or Gulp or something else. Some other process that you do manually that uh, involves thought. So at the moment I know that from, from my example I've got um, a system that when I do a release there's a lot of paperwork to do for that in the kind of card tracking system. So I've automated, or started to automate that. Find something in your day, whether it's a, a personal thing or a work-related thing, and find a way that that takes less of a toll on you. Removes your thought, or removes so much thought about that thing, and see what difference it makes. I would really, really, really like to hear about your experiences if you do that. Thank you.
that comes back to this. You know, if you're constantly being distracted by other things or um, you've made loads of decisions, then you're not going to be able to do that mess work for some four hours or eight hours and still. Any more questions? Uh, do you use your evening for 100% realization or do you ever learn new stuff for us? I do the, sorry, yeah. So the question is, do I use my personal time for learning as well as kind of being in the office? So yeah, sometimes I've actually got a young family, so it's quite difficult to, to do that. But yeah, I'm not saying don't do that. I'm not saying don't spend time learning things and, and doing things that you enjoy. But maybe you'll have more time to do more uh, mental energy to actually focus on those things in the evening or learn if you kind of do some of these techniques. You'll be able to actually kind of get more benefit out of doing that in the evening. You relate uh, the consumption of mental energy to only to making decisions. Mm -hmm. So it's like making decisions yeah. are the most well energy consuming uh, the tasks. Okay. What about switching context? Yeah, so that's another whole other subject entirely, Any? but yeah. Switching context takes well, a toll okay. on you as well. Because every time you're doing that, you're basically using system two thinking to switch. So you're, you're actually focusing on one thing and then you're actually focusing away from that. When you go back into okay. it, you are applying that again. So maybe Reading uh, Facebook or yeah. Reddit or whatever, it's not only about making Correct. small decisions, yeah. it's also about getting back into what you were doing. That's right. Taking a lot of energy to read yeah. the, the registry of the yeah. brain. Yeah. Loads of subjects that are all kind of interrelated here. So, so it about. helps also to have a longer period of mm -hmm. uninterrupted. Yeah, so what you can do is you can batch things. So if you, instead of reading emails like throughout the day, read them at the, in the morning, at lunchtime. At the end of the day, so you're batching your decisions. You're doing one task, then you're doing another task, or then another task. Multitasking does not exist. If you multitask, you're not multitasking. You're stopping doing one thing and then you're doing something else. That's not multitasking. That's just doing one thing at a time. So every time you do that, you're right. I just switch. There's loads of things in this area to do with you know, distractions, context switching, ego depletion, cognitive load. They're all in the same same area. I'm just talking about one one aspect of that. Today. Okay, any more? Do you play a lot of video games? Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> it's, no, no. <laughs> it's just because I was talking about the, the way that um, mental energy is like a, a, a video game uh, health bar. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I'm on Twitter. It's my Twitter handle. Please let me uh, know if you do try any of these things that I talked about. Please try it. I'd really, really love to hear what you've, what you've, you've kind of done and what you found out from doing that. Even if you've tried it and you've not got any benefit from it, please let me know. Um, so that's it. I'll be around if anyone wants to come talk to me. Can you please leave some feedback on the door? So positive to negative feedback. There's post-its and pens over here. Can you just stick them on the door on your way out? That'd be great. Thanks very much.